Thank you, Madam President. What do you call, I don't know the formality. <laughs> Faculty squad, thank you for having me. <laughs> Class of 2017, what up though? Uh, I wish I knew the roots of these skinny digit splinters, these protruding lips that chap in the winter, this bulbous nose that makes me sniffle through prose, I must be a dead ringer for someone's dead finger ring. Fingering piano keys for the ease of a track by track played back to the way back before the back of the bus days of lore folk. Wheel spinning spoke, straining the chain, choked to revoke speech. Preachers, single room schoolhouse teachers before speech therapy, teach to reach parody. Hilarity is a hairy peach pit or a barren beach. With no blood lost to the belly of a leech, how easy to reach lineage. How skinny is the tree bearing fruit with root in the sand. See, effortless connection. But this texture is composed of more complex erector set pieces. Erected and speechless in the image of an image reflected, my mesis is the visage I present and protect, but of what? Assuming I'm a dance, then the choreographer must have these same skinny hands. This is for anyone who has ever gone to sleep, hand outstretched, reaching for something that hits deep. This is for anyone who considers herself matter, too diffuse to be held and too bound to scatter. This is for the nomads who thought they had it right, now bartering with a snowman for his corn cob pipe. This is for the boys and girls kept in mint condition. This is for anyone who will listen. I wrote that piece here in 2003. Uh, it's called Nomad, and it's from a rap adaptation of Gene Toomer's Kane called Sweeter Than, that Elmo Terry Morgan and Marsha Z. West, may she rest in power and all of the academic saints at Rights and Reason Theater uh, poured what in hindsight must have been, yeah, give it up for Rights and Reason Theater. They poured what, in hindsight, must have been a truly massive amount of money uh, on the blind faith that a 21-year-old reluctant theater concentrator had any idea how to transform one of the greatest and most underappreciated works of American fiction into a fully realized play. And reciting those words again now, it, it kind of sucks, right? I mean, like, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit that my mesis is the visage I present. What the hell, dude? <laughs> You're like 21, what do you know about it? <laughs> <laughs> hitting the block like a hammer, hitting the nail on the head and came from a city where hammer made hits and kept people fed and fighting for he Fetty. We hitting the block with hammers and headed into the gritty and ready to rack a cat till they dead. My committee decided whether to ride on another sucker and fire him like his early retirement. I am who they admire and wishing to walk a mile in my zapatos are holy from grinding. Now cue the violin. I wrote that just to stunt. There's no reason. <laughs> There's no... <laughs> Literally no reason for that to be in this speech. Uh, <laughs> David Diggs was born on January 20th, January 20th, 2015, four days before his 33rd birthday, at approximately 9.40 p.m. when he strutted down a fake staircase at the Public Theater in New York, singing a song his friend had written for him to sing, playing a man who would have beat him savagely for singing it had he been born in similar circumstances roughly 224 years prior. That snapping is really weird to me. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I hear that's a thing here now. And do it if you must, but you could also like clap or cheer like a normal person. <laughs> I ain't trying to like restrict your, your way of expressing yourself, whatever. <laughs> uh, about two years and four months later, he has done what two years and four months ago would have felt to him like a life's worth of things. Two films, two arcs on popular TV shows, two tours, produced a pilot for a major network that was picked up, appeared on late night shows as a guest on a couch and as a performer, attended countless red carpets and cocktail parties and award shows, and probably too many speaking engagements, and if he's being honest, he shouldn't be here right now because he's in the last two days of pre-production for another thing he is cramming into a life that feels too short because it didn't start until he had already lived nearly 33 years. And them eyes that's peeking back out from the mirror looking blood bloodshot, plus they carry baggage now, the traveling, it don't stop. Wrapped in every venue from the White House to the dope spot, old enough to know all that experience don't show he know a goddamn thing. Got a hot damn singing that she love him. He should probably find a rock, but she don't apply no pressure. She a diamond too. 
We've been out here shining on these overstuffed times like they wasn't the most violent. Eyes open, I opine, something about how the world is blind. If it were the case, I would be just fine, but I feel like I'm being watched most of the time. But these kids are on these Twitters who are suddenly my fans, and I do it to myself because I do it for the gram, and the whole fam still push grams. But I don't post those pics. I'd rather keep their hands clean. I don't see them often no more. I got a doctor on tour saying not to talk anymore. Mouthpiece, the only piece that still don't got a lock in the drawer. I use it to only a whisper left and then fall to the floor. And I think it's this sentiment that there are only so many words one has the opportunity to say that has him here taking an opportunity to say something to what feels like a very expectant group of young people uh, <laughs> about to enter a new phase in their lives. But the problem is that he really doesn't have anything useful to say because he has only been around for two years and four months. <laughs> so I will speak for him. <laughs> I, uh, I don't think I'm the guy you invited to speak. I don't think I'm the guy getting an honorary doctorate tomorrow. Although I did ask if I could choose what department said doctorate was given in, I asked if uh, it could be in engineering. <laughs> I was told it could not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pre-Hamilton, the only postgraduate interaction I had with the university was in the form of laughable letters and calls from the annual fund to donate money. <laughs> <laughs> to donate money that I did not have. Uh, by the way, I used to work for the calling center here. Do we still call, yeah. Do, uh, do we still call dead people? Is that a thing that we do? Because this is my, my, like, the thing I remember most from working there is reading the little script uh, to whoever answered the phone only to have that person tell me that the man or woman I was calling for was dead. <laughs> In hindsight, this also could have been seen as a good tactic to get us to stop calling. <laughs> Although it, it, uh, it never worked, we always called again. <laughs> I'm not throwing shade, this is just how the game go. Uh, people don't get asked to do these things. List of accomplishments do. And then we sort of struggle to give context or justification to these accomplishments that mostly feel like accidents. Uh, I'm much older and less interesting than David Diggs. I am far less sure of myself, although not according to that article that <laughs> apparently I said I was really charismatic. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I will tell you what I know, and maybe you'll find it useful. I sat right over there in 2004. I think. Um, <laughs> although memory is a funny thing. David Diggs made this very heartfelt speech uh, at the Tonys, and it was like broadcast to millions of people. And it was a speech about his dad wearing rainbow tights. And my mom recently sent me a picture of the actual event he was referencing, and Pops was for sure wearing navy blue sweatpants. <laughs> <laughs> And I had on a rainbow tank top, so <laughs> David Diggs is also a liar. <laughs> anyway, in 2004, I sat somewhere here or someplace else after either walking or not from a classroom or green or something. I'll be honest with you, I don't remember commencement. <laughs> not because I was drunk, although I hope at least some of you are because this talk is probably better. <laughs> yeah, lit section, I heard you. <laughs> Just flasks in the robe. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember the baccalaureate speech or the performances. I don't remember being handed my, di uh, my diploma. Sidebar about the diplomas, though, are they still in Latin? That's a thing. So do yourself a favor and get an official translation of your diploma. Uh, because I know from experience that when applying for a job as a substitute teacher, the clerk of the district office is neither amused nor impressed with your framed gibberish. Um, I, it's, that is so real. It took like four weeks for me to get the little, anyway. <laughs> I don't remember these things. Not because they were unimportant. Quite the contrary. I was the first kid on my father's side of the family to graduate from college. I had accomplished a thing that... <laughs> I 
I had accomplished a thing that my mother had rearranged and rededicated her whole life to facilitate. In fact, I remember at some point after graduating, uh, my mother saying to me, well, you made it. I'm done nagging you now. <laughs> she was not. <laughs> David Diggs' his mother is also a liar. <laughs> She's for sure going to see this <laughs> and then nag me about that. Uh, I had gotten to what I had always imagined was an end game in terms of my formal education. I mean, I'd been in school as long as I could remember, and it was done. It was a big deal. But it was another birth, and nobody actually remembers the circumstances of their birth. We have to be told them. I'm told I was born in two hospitals, that my mom went into labor and went with my dad to Highland Hospital in Oakland, as was the plan, but when the doctors there refused to allow her to have a natural childbirth, they picked up and drove to Alta Bates Hospital in Berkeley, saying, you can give us a room or we can have this baby right here in the lobby. <laughs> David Diggs' parents are gangsters. <laughs> and so here you all are, being born, <laughs> maybe with a little more agency than last time, um, and I actually think it is imperative that you keep alive the story and the circumstances of this birth. That you were born into a time in our country that feels different than any I have lived through. I was on a boat with Sonia Sanchez the day after our last election. And I'm going to pause there and repeat that because that is the coldest name drop you ever heard. <laughs> I was on a boat <laughs> with Sonia Sanchez. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it sound like it was like a two-person like sailboat and we're just <laughs> drinking mint juleps and she's like telling me about the black arts movement and the civil rights movement and I'm like talking to her about clothes from Zara Fit Funny or whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we were actually on a massive cruise ship with like thousands of people and we're about to do this performance and a bunch of artists my age were in the green room having psychotic breaks about the fact that the trajectory of our country had overnight gone from one of hope to one of hate. And finally, someone had the good sense to talk to the living legend sitting calmly in the corner about what she thought of the whole thing. And Sonia shrugged and uh, said that she had watched them kill Martin and Malcolm and Kennedy, that she'd lived through Reagan. She said, this is how it goes in America, three steps forward and two steps back always. She said, you just put your head down and keep fighting. And we all stopped whining. You're being born into a time where our country is as divided as it has ever been where there are no easy answers, where there is no certainty about how to get a job or what constitutes a family, where the news is fake but more real than the alternative facts, where science is ignored but the globe warms anyway, where mezcal may be the most popular alcohol in the country but we're building a wall along our Mexican border, where gender is false but women still earn disproportionately less than men, where race is false, but black boys are still disproportionately gunned down by police. Brown boy sitting on his knees with his eyes shut, hands behind his head, fingers folded, pinkies up, saying he ain't even do nothing what you want. They threw him on the ground when he called them all punks. Retro blue and white Jordan's tongues out over the black jeans cuffed just the right amount. So that they bunched by the calves how he liked, just ran out of box of briefs, so we wearing tidy whities and the white t-shirt and the breeze catch it just so. Pushing it tight against his chest and the red hole is getting wider as the blood is seeping through the fabric and pulling on the ground. He looks down automatic and the dark pavement gets darker when it's wet. He's losing balance slow, but his hands on his head so his face hits first and his eyes go dead and the air is sucked out of the world with his last breath. Time has made a choice of what to keep and what to throw away. Everything ingrained comes to a point so sharp could cut a piece a day and it bleeds on the ground. Keep your knees on the ground where they belong. Keep your knees on the ground where they belong. Just a couple weeks before I moved to New York to start rehearsals for Hamilton, I was riding my bike from my apartment in LA to pay rent. My landlord wouldn't accept checks, so I had to take cash to a nearby check cashing spot that did free money orders. And a police car comes careening around the corner and two officers jumped out and pulled me off my bike and threw me against a fence of my neighbor's house, grabbing my hands and cuffing them behind my back. One twenty-seventh of a second between when the trigger squeezes and the bullet hits my back, we are this close. His breath is hot upon my neck, my hands are folded on my head, I'm doing everything he says, I know how this goes. My nonchalant demeanor is normally meaningless, but if I live today, I know that this will be the reason why. The badge he thinks gives him his power lets me know that that's actually at this moment he is every bit as scared as I. He's been 
train that I'm his enemy in an institution whose motto is to protect and serve. If this is what I can expect for protection, then having that as a motto seems a bit absurd. He never questioned who he was in service to, and let's be honest, man, a motto's really just some words. I know the pen is mightier than the sword, but can it stop a bullet, homie? I'm just not sure, and it's just hot. Los Angeles, summertime is a scandalous ripening of desires and fires that we have bottled up. It ain't no water, so cooler heads aren't often an option. My sweat is popping. If there's a positive motto, what is it? Since Rodney King on the TV, the LAPD is more a monster than man, and I manage with it. My pride doesn't want to let me succumb. I could die just a couple of steps where I reside, and I am not the only one. I exhale and keep my voice low. Yes, you can search me. No, I do not have any weapons you should know about. My backpack is gym clothes and rent money, sir. May I go now? And another part dies in politeness. At least not the part that can write this. But it's only so many times I can bite this tongue, and I'm not the only person who feels like this. This is what you're being born into. And honestly, thank God it is y'all. These times, in many ways, defy explanation. What these times really need are people who challenge all explanations, who never thought outside the box because they never accepted the premise that there was a box. And I know firsthand that the survival of things like Spring Weekend or uh, like the interracial dating forum, is that still a thing? <laughs> if you survive those things, uh, then we are breeding these kinds of people. Our world desperately needs you now. We need your new ideas because our old ones have made a big mess of things. If you're like I was, you're a little nervous in this moment, you know that a lot of people sacrificed for you to get to this point and you feel like you owe them a great success story. But also if you're like I was, you also have no idea what you're going to do after tomorrow. Maybe you have a timeline in your head, some date by which you are supposed to be successful. Let me tell you how that went for me. <laughs> I went to London for a week with the track team, then I moved back home with my mom for longer than I'd like to admit. I did a bunch of plays you've never heard of. I started substitute teaching. I got a place in Fruitvale in Oakland with one of my best friends from here at Brown who had moved to the Bay Area because he didn't fit in anywhere else. I decided I needed to try to live in New York. I couch surfed in New York for nine months, often sleeping on the subway. I auditioned 10 to 12 times a week, booking nothing. I ran out of money. I used my mom's frequent flyer miles to move back home. I did a bunch more plays you've never heard of. I designed rap curriculum for Bay Area middle schools. I fell in love several times. One of those times prompted a move to Los Angeles. I landed a commercial agent. I auditioned for a lot of commercials. I booked one. It was a McDonald's commercial that I booked the same week as I had also agreed to do a reading at a theater in Berkeley and had said I would attend my best friend's bachelor party in Vegas, which means I spent most of that week riding overnight Greyhound buses except for the seven hours I spent in Vegas doing Molly. <laughs> I started a band called Clipping that nobody liked. I toured a lot. I did a bunch of workshops and readings. My friends Lynn and Tommy, who I had met due to a clerical error during a substitute teaching gig, asked me to be in a musical. I went to New York to be in a musical, and David Diggs was born on January 20th, 2015, four days before his 33rd birthday at approximately 9.40 p.m. And I don't feel successful, and neither does he, if he's being honest. Uh, but we know he has trouble with honesty. Um, so the best advice that I can give to those of you who are worried about the when of the rest of your life is stop tripping. <laughs> I'm sure you will all have long lists of accomplishments and multiple rebirths. Some of you will have accomplishments that are asked to speak at colleges or other prestigious institutions. <laughs> Dope, do that. <laughs> they all add up to a pretty silly speech. But the work for you and I and us all in this is the day to day. It's the stitching together of a nation divided. It is in the honest effort to understand the circumstances that the people around us were born into. It is in the boxless thinking. So remember the circumstances of your commencement. Take note of the world you were born into. Tell and retell your birth story. And by all means, forget this speech. <laughs> You are destined for much, much greater things, and I am so excited to witness it. Thank you so much for having me, class of 2017.